Coming to tonight's session on the three essential characteristics of Ravi's leadership journey. Let me give an introduction to our distinguished and eminent speaker of tonight, Ravi Chandran Mahadev. Ravi Chandran is the Vice President of Engineering for SAP Internet of Things product at SAP Labs Pri India Private Limited. He is currently part of the engineering team, which is developing an IoT platform, harnessing the SAP Cloud Platform and SAP Machine Learning Foundation. Ravi has also led product management teams, driving customer adoption and product strategy for BI and analytics. Ravi has a total work experience of 28 plus years and has led product engineering, product management and consulting teams at SAP Labs, HPE, IBM and TCS over the last 2.5 plus decades. A very warm welcome to you, Ravi. We are thrilled to have you here with us tonight. Handing the session over to you. Thank you, Shama, for that introduction, and I hope I am audible. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much, uh, and uh, good evening to all the people who are listening in today, and uh, thank you for being here. Um, and uh, I want to thank IPL for this opportunity to be able to talk about um, the uh, my leadership journey here in the past uh, two and a half plus decades. And uh, thank you to the IPL team uh, for this. <clears throat> Without uh, much further ado, uh, let me start to share my screen. Thank you, Shama. And uh, so uh, as the session uh, is titled, we're gonna be talking about the three essential tenets of my leadership journey. And I hope that you find these um, uh, inputs to be not only insightful for most of you, but hopefully inspirational for some of you. And um, you can take back uh, some of these uh, practices and apply them to your work um, uh, as you um, are gonna be uh, you know, using some of these techniques in my opinion. So without much further ado, um, just a little bit about myself, uh, a little more than what the introduction already said. Um, I'm a computer science engineer uh, with about 28 plus years of experience in the software industry. And um, I have uh, spent time in both professional services as consulting for close to 11 years and product development uh, for close to 17 years. So I have a view to both sides of the coin where you're delivering solutions to end customers uh, and of course also developing products uh, for uh, uh, either customers or partners in the industry. The domains that I've worked in, um, the financial services and telecom, prominently from the professional services and consulting. From a product development standpoint, I've been in hardware diagnostics, analytics, and IoT uh, in the last 17 plus years. I have, I also hold um, a US patent on uh, enterprise search. Uh, you can get the details from my LinkedIn profile. Um, I've been associated with IPL in the past. Um, I did a jury uh, duty for the startups cohort in 2018 uh, at CMR, uh, which is one of the institutes um, uh, from where um, you are associated. And um, if you were to get a sneak peek into my leadership style, uh, I usually use coaching quite a bit in my leadership style. Uh, I am detail oriented and very, very passionate passionate about building organization capability. And that's uh, something that we will touch upon uh, in the course of the next 30, 35 minutes that I'm going to be talking about of the essential tenets. <clears throat> what are the key takeaways for the participants today from this session? Um, obviously, yes, we talked about the three essential tenets, which are called from my experience in the industry with leading teams and organizations for last 18 and plus years. Um, and what are some of the areas of focus in the new normal? I, as we all understand, and we, as we are today, uh, all virtual, this has been the course uh, in the last uh, one to two years. And um, I would like to probably uh, emphasize on some of the areas of focus in the new normal, uh, which could also help you uh, in your journey. <clears throat> so coming to uh, what essentially uh, is leadership. So uh, could we saw, can we call this uh, uh, associated to some position in an organization or is it um, related to a title that you carry? Is it a particular rank or a level? Um, 
like a vice president or an executive vice president or a senior manager or a director or a tech lead, whatever that may be, um, wherever you are leading teams, uh, either directly or indirectly, um, uh, is it associated with that? Can it be defined in the first place? Um, and, for, and lastly, um, is it a wicked problem? Uh, and we'll come back to this concept of wicked problem in a minute. And when you look at these questions, it's essentially clear that um, most of these are, are not true when it comes to leadership. Uh, leadership can be uh, executed without holding um, a position and not having a senior enough title, uh, doesn't require a rank or a level, and very hard to define um, because each, essentially each um, leader, each uh, person has, uh, should I say, uh, developed uh, what they believe are uh, the essentials for being able to efficiently and uh, leading, uh, leading and performing uh, high performance teams. And um, I believe in what I'm gonna be showing now next, <clears throat> because leadership is not about being in charge. Uh, it's actually about taking care of those in your charge. And this is something which um, I think uh, we're gonna be touching upon uh, in every uh, of the facets that I talk about going forward. And um, here is where I think uh, you make the essential difference of making organizations successful, making people successful, um, and having the right talent for the right problem and getting out of the way of those talented people because they are gonna take care uh, of <clears throat> whatever problems that you may have in mind. And this was actually espoused very well um, in one of the um, very highly publicly acclaimed leaders, uh, Vineet Nair, um, who was uh, in, in the past the CEO of HCL. And he said, employee first and customer second. And um, <clears throat> essentially the theory behind that was that if you have happy and engaged employees in the organization, they are gonna take care of the customers and the customer problems and also being able to essentially delivering innovation. <clears throat> and this worked out very well in the context that HCL was in at that point in time. Moving along, uh, coming back to the uh, concept of a wicked problem, uh, and leadership is a wicked problem, and I'll try to explain this to you in a couple of minutes from now. But it is definitely not what you're seeing here, and uh, I like Dilbert because there's a lot of satire about uh, <clears throat> a lot of concepts in, uh, in organizations, and the, here is where you also see um, what he taught, what Dilbert says about leadership. And this is certainly not what I mean by being a wicked problem where you could probably place uh, some responsibilities or delegate something to another person uh, in the, either in your organization uh, or, or to your peer. So the term wicked problem was actually coined very long back in, in, a, in a late uh, 1960s. And um, essentially it uh, talks about a problem that is uh, difficult to solve, um, if not impossible, and has a lot of you know, competing requirements uh, which are constantly changing. A uh, lot of stakeholders involved and therefore it can be that every stakeholder has a perspective of the situation at hand. And uh, essentially there is no right solution. There is no um, right or wrong here. It's only uh, good or bad or better or worse kind of solutions. And one of the key examples of a wicked problem that we see currently uh, being strongly advocated by a lot of uh, C-suit uh, uh, employees is about climate change, right? And this is taking center stage in a lot of organizations because um, uh, this has a long-standing impact on what we do on our beloved planet. Um, and climate change is a very complex problem. It's an interdisciplinary problem. It doesn't have solutions uh, for all of it, of, of what it can be. <clears throat> and we have 
possibly taken a small bit of the climate change, which is called carbon emissions. And this is what most organizations are currently focused on, uh, where they are looking to become carbon neutral or even carbon negative going forward. Um, and a lot of organizations, large uh, and to medium organizations have looked up this in terms of how they want to attack carbon emissions. And this is a classic example of a wicked problem. And uh, in some sense, leadership is also uh, something similar, where you're going to have multiple layers to a particular problem, and you need to peel the onion uh, one layer at a time to be able to uh, understand and to be able to provide uh, some kind of a contextual solution. The reason why I say contextual, because it depends on what the context that you're operating in, and also that uh, it may not uh, be the solution or it is not a best practice that you can apply to any solution, uh, to any problem that you may come across. Um, actually, uh, to make it a little more clear, uh, problems uh, can be tame uh, or wicked. Uh, there's actually a third class of problem called critical problems. Um, uh, and uh, to get in the context of um, product management, a tame problem could be a functional requirement, and uh, which uh, essentially you know that it is a customer uh, requirement that can be solved technologically, that can be solved within the product or within a suite of products that you are offering to the customer. And um, it has a clear answer. Uh, which is within an organized problem space. But that is not so true as I explained in the wicked problem space. And the third class, which is a critical problems, I have not focused over here. This is something essentially which is uh, going to impact the lifeline of a particular organization or a unit. And uh, it essentially requires immediate solutioning, uh, usually. Um, uh, for example, if a startup were to run out of funding, then that's a critical problem uh, which has to be resolved immediately. <laughs> Moving along uh, and getting into the uh, into the key of uh, my presentation today, what are the three essential pillars or tenets of my leadership that I would like to talk about today? Um, first one being feedback, um, and uh, this is uh, perhaps the uh, uh, the critical cog in. Uh, taking care of those people who are in charge uh, uh, or who are in your team. Um, and this is the reason why, uh, you know, uh, 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 feedback is so important in order to be able to build trust, in order to be able to provide the required level of inputs that somebody can take and become and, and use it as an, uh, or make it actionable for that individual uh, so that they can move in their leadership journey. <clears throat> or even in their just corporate life, so to say. Second one being innovation, and this is more from a product standpoint. Uh, of course, there can be process innovations as well, but I focus on product innovation. And um, uh, this is again, uh, key to uh, having a high performing team and to be able to retain them because this gives a sense of ownership to the organization that you are leading. And finally, we talk about coaching, um, which is uh, how you build organization capability. Of course, you can do that through feedback as well, but coaching works uh, very well. And um, um, uh, I have been uh, privileged to uh, study the part one of the international uh, certificate for coaching um, from ICF. Um, and uh, uh, I've been applying this in my work and we'll look at some examples today uh, going forward. <clears throat> Next up, I want to talk about what is theory of marginal improvement. And this is something which some of you might have heard, and this is something which some of you might be even practicing. Um, and uh, it is also called continuous improvement. Uh, for those of you, just to remove the jargon here, uh, and continuous improvement is something which all of us in agile organizations uh, look into. But uh, the essential concept here is as follows, right? So. If you are doing the same thing 365 days a year, you're not going to move uh, the, uh, move move much. You're going to be probably remaining where you are and probably even regress to a certain degree because people around you have moved ahead. And um, uh, in, in simple terms, this is not a good strategy. However, if you make some marginal improvements, um, and this can be as little as 1% uh, in several of the small areas, uh, you could see that an accumulative effect 
when you make a point uh, for a 1% improvement over 365 days, suddenly you have a large change that you can make. And this was, this is a theory which applies to each one of those tenets, whether it's feedback, whether it's innovation, or whether it is coaching, where you can use these principles, you can use these tenets to bring about that 1% change, either in a process or in a product or in a person, to be able to build um, the next version um, of what you want to put out in front of customers, or you want to probably uh, make a subtle change in the process of your organization, or even build uh, people with the right capabilities within the organization. Um, this works very well. This is highly scalable, and you don't have to look at uh, you know, an unimaginably large problem uh, if you take at small chunks and be able to guide uh, people, process some products, uh, it works really well. <clears throat> so let's look at it in detail and I will probably talk about some uh, uh, examples uh, of how feedback has helped um, some of my um, uh, 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 direct reports in the organization. Um, Shama, are you still able to see my slides? Yes, I can. I was going to interrupt Ravi. Uh, do you want to take that poll that we decided? Yes, please. Should I run it, the first yes. question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Audience, please go ahead and cast your votes. Uh, we have a few questions for you related to the topic of the uh, webinar. Please take this poll on the screen and let us know your thoughts. Great. Uh, Ravi, can you see the results? Yeah, thank you so much, Shama. And uh, yeah, as you've essentially uh, pointed out here, people are the most important assets in an organization. And therefore, uh, uh, you know, being able to work your leadership principles in a way that can help employees, uh, that can help your stakeholders, that can help customers, that can help your peers is perhaps the most important uh, tenet that you would probably want to take forward with you. Though uh, in the recent days, we talk about data as being an important asset as well. Uh, you've talked, I think there are lots of things as data is the new oil, data is the new engine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, it is, uh, it is also rightly mentioned as the second most important asset. And um, uh, I think we have a, um, very uh, 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 intelligent participation here. So thank you so much for your feedback. Um, I think we can uh, move on, Shama. Sure, please. Um, Do I launch the second poll or we move on with the presentation? Yeah, we will just move on. Um, maybe after the uh, next two or three pillars. Uh, Great, can... let me know and I'll launch it. Yeah, yeah. So coming back to the first essential thing about feedback. So this, uh, I think this, this is about not only giving feedback, but also receiving feedback, right? So, and this is where you know, a lot of leaders essentially falter because you need to be able to provide not only the right level of feedback, which is respectable, which has different points of view, but also timely feedback so that, you know, the, the, the individual um, or, um, if, if, if you're receiving feedback for a product, uh, the organization can take appropriate action in terms of what um, uh, the next steps are gonna be. So let me take an example of um, uh, one of the uh, 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 very uh, you know, uh, smart leaders uh, currently in the industry who was part of my team way back in 2005, almost when I was uh, you know, in the initial stages of my leadership journey. And she came up to me, um, this was a team that I had inherited um, uh, because I joined this organization fresh and we had a few conversations to begin with to understand what the context is, what the history is, um, what are the facts on the table. And then uh, after about uh, four months or so, it was time for our first feedback session. Um, and that's when uh, she gave this very interesting input to me. And she said, um, you know what, Ravi, um, uh, I think uh, any feedback session so far that I've had with any of my previous managers and leaders have been, has been useless. And it hasn't had any iota of impact either on my career or on my interest uh, or in the organization. 
Uh, this was uh, kind of a very critical feedback that I received right uh, very beginning of my career as in the in the leadership journey, and um, obviously uh, it was kind of uh, uh, shocking to receive this feedback. Uh, but then um, this is what actually uh, makes or breaks the team and the trust that you build with the team. Such you can probably look at this as an opportunity to be able to do the right thing, and then that person becomes an ambassador for you or for the organization across the company and uh, or for the unit across the across the organization. So um, I think um, uh, in the next uh, 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 weekly uh, sync that I had with her, I shared with her a lot of inputs in terms of um, uh, where I see the lacune, whether it is to do with uh, the the impact that she was having within the organization, the kind of work that she was leading, given the fact that she was already eight to nine years uh, of uh, of experience in in the technical role, and um, how her uh, peers uh, in the organization. Uh, we're viewing her, and this is basis of, of course, collecting all the data points. Uh, the key was that I spent the time in terms of not only collecting data, which is hard facts, and at the same time, um, um, being able to present it uh, in a way that is forward looking for that particular individual so that uh, she could actually take actionable steps to improve. And, um, and I think um, this had a very, very uh, uh, exponential impact uh, on her, and she not only did well, uh, she's done so well that she's now a co-founder of a company. Um, uh, and um, uh, I think all kudos to her for being able to take those uh, actionable insights from what I shared with her. Um, the second example that I want to take about is more on the product side. Um, we were developing a very cool uh, innovation. Uh, and of course, I will take the same example when I get into the innovation pillar. And here, uh, you know, we were developing what was called as a mind map of, <clears throat> this was in the uh, this was in the space of enterprise search, a diff little different from um, what you, you would essentially do with Google, uh, but this is within the scope of the enterprise. Um, and it was in the analytics space. Um, and we were building a mind map of all the terms that were being used in a, in a natural language query and presenting it to the user as a graph. Uh, you can imagine a graph database. Um, and what happened here was um, once we had developed this concept as a, as a proof of concept, so to speak, and then we said, let's do some user research here in terms of how this would be perceived as uh, important for, because we felt that having to see the relationship between the different terms that were being, um, uh, that were part of the natural language query would be something that would be very interesting for the end user. And when we did the user research as a part of our, um, uh, as a part of the events that uh, usually um, SAP hosts all across the world, we kind of understood that, um, you know, uh, that this was very technical for the user. Uh, somebody who's, will, who's, who's wanting to actually uh, bring out uh, some smart visualizations out of the data that they have in the data warehouse or a data lake is not uh, very much interested in the relationships uh, of the terms that they have published in. So uh, this was, you know, something which was recorded in early. We kind of removed this uh, from our product, but essentially the, the the core concept still remained inside the product because this was this was how we were navigating, let's say, what was related terms to what the user has typed in a natural language query, but that was not essential for the choose for the user to actually see it. It actually needed to be represented in a different way, uh, in a more simpler way so that, you know, they didn't feel uh, overwhelmed by such a, um, by such a representation. Um, so this helped us in our journey of innovating uh, with that particular uh, 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 key idea that we were developing. Um, Looking at a third example, um, maybe I'll do this quickly since we need to move on to the other pillars. Um, this was an example or a recent example uh, in the last three or four years uh, where um, I had an individual um, uh, who, I know, um, we, were in a, we were in an offsite and uh, he came up to my table um, and we were having dinner and he said, um, Ravi, if you were to give an advice to somebody who's um, just starting in his journey, 
um, what could that be in terms of uh, how to develop the right skills or how to move up the value chain in an organization. And um, uh, at that point in time, uh, what I told them is not something which is rocket science. This is something which has been practiced by a lot of other leaders. Uh, I told them, since you're young, it's very, very easy for you to take some risks at this point in time to go for your passions rather than being you know, uh, triangulated with um, uh, what the organization can offer you uh, or what a particular unit can offer you. Uh, go for your passion and uh, you know build upon the skills and it is only when you are between probably 20 and 30 years old when you can do this. Um, and then within 30 and 40, you probably start to go deep um, uh, within what you have found as a passion for you. And um, uh, I'm glad to say that you know this person again uh, was very open to this input and um, uh, he took uh, product security as uh, something which was key to his uh, um, uh, passion and uh, right now he is uh, leading uh, product security at um, uh, one of the larger uh, enterprise software organizations. Uh, but yeah, sadly enough, I had to lose him, uh, but that's not the point. I mean, you are basically building capabilities of individuals. Uh, maybe I still have a friend in the, in, in the community um, who's willing to come back and work for me anytime that I have a suitable position for him. And that's what you want to build as a community, as, as people, as leaders in the, in, in the, in the organization. <clears throat> um, moving on uh, to the second pillar, um, which is about innovation. And, um, and I think here, um, this is of course dear to most product managers and um, you need to have uh, obviously all of the bubbles out there talk about uh, uh, what uh, innovation could mean, could, could, could mean to a new idea, which leads to probably growth, uh, leads to, uh, needs creativity, comes from an inspiration or a vision. And, um, uh, and this is something which can be executed in multiple ways. And I'm gonna talk about um, uh, not the process of innovation itself, but more in terms of how you want to execute something which you have as an idea, right? And there are two or three different ways that I have gone about it. Um, and some have worked and some have not worked. And that's what I want to share today. Uh, my first idea of innovation was, you know, uh, when we had a large organization of 400 plus people um, that I was in the leadership team for, uh, we thought, um, let's create an, an, an innovation event. And what we will do is we will invite for ideas where people will come and, uh, you know, related to your uh, strategy, related to your vision for the organization and for the unit and for the product domain, uh, you invite ideas and ask people to, you know, spend some time coding and come back with uh, actual real uh, <clears throat> working uh, product ideas. Um, and we spent about three to four months calling with a lot of ideas. And then finally you have a jury which selects the top two or three. Obviously it goes a lot of way in, you know, um, uh, inspiring some of the folks and engaging employees in the right way. Uh, but then you need to have a plan post that. And this is where we miss the uh, wisdom ball and miss the ticket. Um, once you have a lot of ideas uh, or, or even the winning ideas, uh, what you need to do with them and how you need to take it into the product is something which is a completely different ball game. And this is where you need to build um, your network, you need to have the right influencers, you need to have an executive sponsor who can take up these ideas and bring it into the product. And this is where, um, uh, sadly to say, we missed the bus. So it kind of resulted in, <coughs> excuse me. Okay. It kind of resulted in um, um, uh, sort of uh, a disengagement at the, at the other end after the high because we couldn't take some of these ideas forward. The second, um, uh, uh, should I say iteration of where we did innovation was what I was talking about a little bit earlier, uh, which was in the context of enterprise search. Now, um, I think the problem statement there was how, do, how can we uncover um, uh, what has been 
created within an analytics platform so that people don't keep on recreating the same information, the same visualizations, the same insights again and again and again, because they don't know that it has already been done by somebody else in the in the organization or in a, in a customer's um, uh, domain. Now, um, of course, this was uh, uh, a simple problem to solve, but when we looked at this, we said, why in the first place do we even need to create content? Um, why can't we just use search uh, with natural language query to be able to even create the same analytical content with smart visualizations, which, which can understand the, uh, the attributes that were actually being uh, typed in a query and bring that to the fore in, term, in, terms, of a, in terms of a smart insight. Um, and this is something which uh, was an organic innovation coming bottoms up, uh, but very much aligned to the organization strategy, uh, very much aligned to the, to the domain in which we were working. Um, and um, we kind of won the Founders Award, uh, this was way back in 2012, for this idea um, amongst uh, about 600 plus ideas that were submitted across the entire uh, company. And um, uh, this is uh, something which uh, inspires the organization because everybody looks up uh, that if this team could do it, if this individual could do it, or if this product team could bring this up, others can also do this. And uh, re re results in a lot of high engagement, high performing teams, um, which uh, also brings a sense of ownership because once you've innovated on a particular idea, you also can, you know, having the, uh, uh, you know, the, the topmost, um, uh, should I say, um, uh, uh, sponsor of the um, of the award, uh, providing you with the required funding, with the required team to be able to build this as a part of uh, a larger product was something that was given to you. And an organic innovation which is aligned is actually very very helpful, highly scalable, and something which uh, can be um, <clears throat> easily replicated in a lot of organizations. But the key here is that. Um, make this part of your job rather than having innovation as a department. It is not, is never a department. It has to be part of your own organization where um, you need to actually, you know, build those concepts uh, uh, grounds up. But it's not that having a separate department for innovative ideas doesn't work. In some cases where you need to make a very disruptive uh, uh, thinking, uh, uh, let's say in case of building autonomous cars or electric vehicles, and you're moving from ICE to EV, then you probably need a different level of thinking because the technology is different. And sometimes to be able to create the department which can actually innovate on these concepts can also help. So it depends on the context, it depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, but in this uh, particular situation, this organic innovation really helped. Um, in a third example, um, uh, which is uh, again from my current role, um, I think right from the beginning, my thought process was that um, uh, we will have uh, some um, bandwidth that we will keep for innovation within our organization. And, um, uh, and we will make use of this bandwidth to come up with new ideas, which are uh, and need to be uh, as, a, as a precursor or as even a selection criteria of what we will innovate on. We, we wanted to make sure that this is completely aligned with the strategy. And we kind of you know, brought in um, and the executive sponsor right at the beginning and said that uh, you know, um, the, the domain that we are working on is, is what we are going to be innovating uh, in. And um, we kind of had a virtual team and this kind of spurred the other units uh, under my manager uh, uh, to also look for such ideas. And then we had a virtual team across different locations that were brainstorming innovative ideas and you know uh, even look at uh, some of the customer problems that uh, were being put in um, and uh, trying to bring uh, across uh, an, an organic idea which can actually be useful and that we kind of use this very, very effectively in a lot of customer conversations uh, because then we are not only talking about current existing solutions, but we are also talking about to a certain degree um, under NDA for uh, the, the roadmap as well, NDA meaning non-disclosure agreements. And this kind of helped us 
in a lot of customer uh, deals that we worked upon. Um, and as, as I talked about this, this is also uh, another way of doing innovation is customer co-innovation, right? Where you have a bunch of customers who have some problems or a common problem that can be solved collaboratively between, uh, between uh, let's say, a vendor and a customer and uh, or customers. And um, you kind of invest time and money uh, to be able to build the right solution. And then right from day one, you actually have customers who can uh, take this forward. Um, moving along um, in next one, uh, which is perhaps um, uh, something which uh, very, very critically helps people in organizations right next to feedback is coaching. And um, you will see that there is a cycle on top. Uh, it, uh, this is also called the GROW model. Uh, G standing for goal. What are the individual's goals uh, in terms of uh, where he or she wants to go? Um, uh, what are the options uh, that are in hand um, uh, and uh, what that particular individual is willing to look into? What is the current reality? I mean, uh, this current situation, the current context, uh, how much time he or she has? Um, and uh, finally, what is the commitment? What will that particular individual do in order to make the change, in order to actually reach the goal? And this is an iterative process. You can always have um, uh, multiple ways, um, or you can have, of course, uh, development goals, which continue to evolve over a period of time. And therefore you continue to use this uh, grow model very effectively. <clears throat> and uh, I heard Shama right at the beginning where she talked about, you know, um, the fact that uh, there are people who are switching roles. And uh, I have a classic example of uh, a support engineer um, who uh, I coached and uh, she has now moved into a product management role. Um, and we spent about uh, uh, three months uh, together in uh, several one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations of 30 minutes each. Now, as you essentially understand, coaching is different from mentoring, and I'm sure a lot of people uh, here understand that. Um, and uh, what happens here is that you're expecting that the individual not only defines the problem, but is also able to think through the options. You just, as, as a coach, yeah, your uh, objective is to be uh, able to reflect what the person is saying, to be able to give uh, some open-ended questions to that particular individual so that they are able to think in different directions. Uh, and when they are coming out with options, uh, you know, uh, uh, probably lean back on some of your experiences and uh, uh, try to give um, uh, some guidance on uh, uh, what has worked for other individuals uh, in the past and what has not worked so that you can, you know, uh, limit to what the commitments are going to be. And this has worked very wonderfully right now. She is now moved from her support role uh, to, to, uh, uh, to essentially uh, taking a first step uh, into product management. Of course, this is a big change. Uh, there are several things that she needs to learn in terms of what a product manager is, is expected to do and how does agile play into this product management role uh, are several things that she's learning uh, up front. Um, and uh, needless to say, um, you know, um, uh, coaching is a very, very effective tool when you're trying to build um, organization capability. There was another example where <clears throat> I have used this to help uh, a senior engineer move to an architect role. Uh, uh, and uh, this was, again, something which, uh, you know, uh, we went through <clears throat> uh, why the, the person felt um, uh, and you always start with the why, right? And uh, because that is where the purpose, that is where the vision of that particular individual uh, comes into play. Um, and um, uh, you kind of, you know, uh, also understand whether the person is actually coachable, whether the person is actually open uh, to thinking um, uh, Decide or, or even move into uncomfortable situations uh, which will lead to growth. Um, and um, sometimes you come across people who are going to be not coachable, who are not going to be probably agreeing with you. And that's perfectly all right. It's um, uh, That's not something which uh, is, uh, you will come across all sorts of people and uh, therefore um, uh, coachability of the coachee is very, very important uh, in order for you to be able to achieve the desired results. And um, 
uh, <clears throat> and I think uh, this has uh, been uh, one of the very key cornerstones that I'm more and more using. Uh, this is, of course, a very, very recent thing that I have started to make use of. Um, uh, in the last four to five years that I have, uh, ever since I finished my uh, first part of the certification, I've been trying to use this in practice uh, to be able to bring up the organization capability. Uh, Shama, do you want to now uh, bring up the second poll? Sure, Ravi, I'll do that. Are you able to see the results, Ravi? Yes, I am able to. Thank you. Um, so... Uh, why this poll now uh, decision making obviously is the essence of leadership right so you are going to be able to you will have to make tough decisions you will have to make uh, probably even simple decisions at times um, um, uh, critical or even bad decisions which are not which are going to be unpopular uh, with some team members and those are all uh, um, you know experiences that you gain and um, it, hence it is important for you to understand uh, when uh, you actually make a decision. Um, a lot of you have said that when you have probably 80% uh, probability of success is when you would probably would go with the decision. Um, and uh, this is uh, something which is largely true. And this is something which um, essentially see with a lot of people, uh, with a lot of peers uh, in the in the community and even in the uh, in the ecosystem, and uh, it's not surprising that a lot of you have taken this uh, view of eighty percent probability success. But uh, the uh, the essential uh, part of this to understand is that you will not have all the data to be able to take a decision um, at the point in time that you want to take. Uh, so obviously there is uh, the 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 uh, the amount of information that you have is also dependent on how much ambiguity do you have in the problem that you're trying to define, and uh, forty to seventy percent is actually a good. Um, benchmark for when you take a decision. Uh, when you have between 40 to 70% probability of success and also the information that this can actually lead to success, the rest of the decision has to come from your gut feeling. Um, and yeah, of course you can go wrong. And, uh, and of course it can be unpopular. Of course it can be um, uh, some things which uh, 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 may backfire. And these are things which uh, leaders have to take in their stride uh, and learn from it. Um, and um, uh, I think uh, uh, this is perhaps the most uh, important aspect of leadership, uh, though I have not covered it as a as a pillar because this is something which comes with the job. Um, and um, uh, I believe uh, that having, uh, trying to wait for a lot of information can you could probably miss the market, especially if you're in a product uh, fast moving product uh, space and you want to quickly bring out the product. You cannot wait for 80 to 90 percent of the information to be with you before taking a decision to bring it to market. Or uh, a classic example is uh, uh, time to market versus quality, and uh, which one do you prioritize? And um, at certain points in time, you will have to probably prioritize time to market over quality, um, over acceptable quality. That's what is actually the key word. And, um, and you kind of bring the product to the market and, you know, make sure that you are able to actually gain some customer base um, and not wait for 100% uh, uh, of uh, no problems to be resolved before then you might have missed the bus. Um, so moving along, um, and now I'm going to move on to the second part of my, um, um, we have 10 more minutes. Um, so the last uh, of my slides here, um, and this is obviously in the context of the new normal uh, that we are having in the last one to one and a half years, right? This is a completely new experience for a lot of us. Um, we talk about having uh, difficult conversations, having feedback sessions, having coaching sessions. All of this work very well in a setup where you have face-to-face -face physical conversations because you are not only uh, getting to see uh, the demeanor of the person, the way the person is reacting to your uh, to the inputs, uh, which are non-verbal clues, which are very important to being successful. Uh, but this is not the case when you are in a in a remote uh, organization or in a remote setup where you are talking to a person over a phone. Um, video calls do work, uh, but uh, not always. Um, but then this is video calls are a little better than, of course, just hearing the voice of the other person. 
Uh, and there are a couple of tenets that uh, come out uh, if you see the leaders in the organization. And let's talk about first one being empathy. And uh, this is uh, very critical now in the current situation where you empathize with, um, with your customers, with your employees, with your stakeholders in the organization. Try to understand. Empathy is different from pity and sympathy. Pity and sympathy is about understanding somebody's problem, but empathy is about feeling that particular person's problem in a way that you are able to take um, the compassionate action. That is where the... Um, uh, the, the graph is actually indicating in terms of how much aware you're about others' difficulties. And in the current situation, there are a lot of people going through a lot of difficult situations. And it is very, very important that you are empathetic uh, to this uh, situation. And a person uh, who, am I, who I admire and who is basically, um, you know, um, uh, built an organization about radical empathy is Sridhar Vembu, right? And he is the CEO of Zoho Corp. And um, uh, in fact, he practices empathy to the extent that it is called radical empathy, uh, where um, he doesn't go with uh, fads or uh, what, is, what is the next trendy thing that we need to do. He talks about... Um, what is uh, going to make uh, people successful. Um, uh, for example, uh, when Zoho started, they had their uh, headquarters in, the, um, in, in Silicon Valley, but then he was the first one to move to Austin, Texas uh, before uh, a lot of the other companies started to move into Texas. And this was something seen as a very unpopular decision, but then he was working from an empathetic situation where he felt that as employees of the organization, they wanted to have or be able to build uh, a home of their own. And this was not possible in a highly um, expensive city like, like in California. Uh, and therefore, uh, moving to a lesser costly environment with, uh, within Austin and Texas, you know, reduced that tax or burden on employees' shoulders and therefore made that person more productive in an organization. Uh, of course, uh, I'm, uh, you're sh I'm sure you've heard about empathetic conversations from um, uh, from Satya, uh, uh, who's the CEO of Microsoft, who has basically led a complete turnaround, um, uh, starting with empathy as a key cornerstone for building uh, products and innovations. Uh, let's move on to the next one, uh, which is about ethics. Um, ethics has been there for quite some time. I was leading, uh, I was part of an ethics uh, a committee way back in 2001, um, almost 20 years ago. And um, at that point in time, it was about uh, fairness, transparency, accountability uh, within uh, the unit that I was working on. And, uh, and of course, there are whistleblowers when they see that this ethic uh, were not being met and you have to deal with this in a confidential way. And ethics is making a big comeback in the context of artificial intelligence. And this is something which you as product managers need to be very much aware of. And I'm sure you've read a lot of uh, um, <clears throat> thread about uh, what is right and what is wrong, uh, simply because um, in the way that the, uh, the algorithms are built, the way the data is collected, all of it has a lot of bias in it um, because these are built by people who've, who already have bias in the thinking. And how do you take the bias out from the algorithms that are being built by people is a very, uh, very big um, uh, way of dealing with it. And um, I think um, every organization is dealing with this in, a, in, in its own way. They, again, we are seeing the rise of ethics committee, uh, which basically look at how their algorithms are being written, uh, review the uh, fairness uh, and review the um, observability and the transparency. Basically, how did you arrive at a particular decision using an algorithm is very, very important for a user to understand. Uh, very much uh, similar to how we were trying to explain uh, the word graph, uh, looking at a natural language query using um, uh, using a using a, a, a networked uh, a graph, and uh, this is the same thing which is expected today um, when you look at AI and algorithms. And this is uh, something which uh, I would expect a lot of product managers and product leaders to keep in mind as we build uh, new and new um, uh, capabilities within our products to uh, you know, take this uh, 
uh, ethical AI as a concept and ethical algorithms, which will remove bias, bring transparency, and um, also traceability in terms of how uh, a decision was actually formed. With that, I end my session. I think I've run over. Maybe there are a few minutes for Q&A. Uh, Shama, do you want to share some of the top questions? <clears throat> Sure, we, we have a few minutes for Q&A, but firstly, thank you for delivering a brilliant session. Really great insights. And I, I see two questions in the Q&A window. You can also see them. Uh, meanwhile, audience, the first question is from Anike. Every organization talks a lot about innovation, employee submitting number of ideas, but lots of support required for implementation of idea and guidance. How to create whole value chain system and how can we measure impact of implemented innovation? Yeah, this is a, a very good uh, question. And as I talked about this a little while ago, when we had this uh, event that we were trying to organize and we were asking for employees to submit a lot of uh, ideas and uh, we kind of faltered at the, at the end as to how to take this forward in terms of implementation. Um, but uh, what is essential is uh, that uh, you know you have the right level of sponsorship within your organization um, to um, uh, to take these ideas forward, and um, uh, and what is uh, important is that you are um, the the key to this is actually being able to influence right and bringing your stakeholders who are going to be key to taking this to market or or making this uh, executable let's say in the engineering organization and uh, uh, and and bringing this to the table where um, your initial idea may actually change to something uh, very different. And you need to be open as an innovator as well to be able to do that. And not all of them actually lead to uh, new products and new solutions. Let's be also honest. We all want to develop new products and bring in that um, uh, measure of uh, you know, success to our lives. But sometimes this could become a small feature in a larger product, uh, but still bring value to the customers that um, uh, that are making use of it. Now, the, the key the answer to this is basically influence, where you need to talk to your stakeholders, bring the value chain, go to talk to go-to-market, uh, talk to your sales folks, and a lot of uh, sessions where you actually evangelize your idea internally is perhaps very, very important for you to be able to uh, make that uh, in, uh, innovation real for you. And once it is part of the product, obviously you can measure with the regular metrics of usage <clears throat> or even customer feedback um, <clears throat> to be able to bring, um, um, to see the impact that this is actually bringing. <clears throat> <clears throat> Shall we go to the second question, Shama? <clears throat> sure. We'll take this next question from Sendil. When the organization decides to, decides to downsize in a tough business environment like the current pandemic, how does one as a middle management leader manage the transition with empathy to his or her impacted team? Yeah, tough one. Um, um, thank you, Sendil, for that very, very um, inquisitive question. Um, this is not something which is easy uh, for, for you to be able to uh, bring uh, a bad news uh, to your employees in the organization. Um, but this is a business reality, right? You have to deliver that news. Um, but what is important is to be able to offer help. You are a senior leader, not only in your organization, but you're also a senior leader in the in 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 the in your network, in your ecosystem, and willing to offer help to find alternate um, positions either within the organization or outside the organization is the best that you can do to be able to being empathetic in this particular situation. And this has worked wonders uh, uh, when you're able to help people navigate this very, very difficult transition. And uh, no matter whether this is, whether there is this pandemic or not, uh, there has been these situations even before where you're, where you're asked to actually take um, a tough call and you have to downsize a particular business because it's no longer a priority. Um, obviously, as a leader, if you've been able to 
I, uh, to be able to kind of predict the direction this is going basis the strategy you put up you should have taken st- uh, steps even earlier to move your organization and employees to 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 uh, other areas which are of strategic importance and reskill your employees but if you are not able to make that uh, prediction and you are not able to understand the direction uh, please be helpful uh, in these difficult situations and empathetic to them to and help them to the extent that you could Moving on to the next question, uh, this is from Harish. This is in the chat window, uh, Ravi. Mm-hmm. Does a leader delegate innovation to the team or needs to be self-innovated? I think um, uh, innovation is about collective intelligence, right? Uh, one person does not come up with this innovative thought one fine day. It's not like a bulb, Eureka, and you've got something which you can build, uh, which could be a multi-billion dollar business. Collective intelligence, where you are bringing together like-minded people who are also interested in that particular domain or uh, or product idea, uh, but bring in different facets. One could be from user experience, one could be from sales, uh, and a third person could be from engineering or architecture. Bringing together these different facets of um, uh, 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 and, and technical skills on the table is going to help you um, uh, bring innovation not only to the table, but also finally into a product and uh, deliver to this. It is never an individual's, um, um, uh, uh, should I say, uh, uh, prerogative to, uh, you, what you can do is to create an environment where uh, innovation is actually um, looked uh, as uh, important uh, and is, is part of your culture, is part of the DNA. And that is what you as a leader create, where you probably encourage new ideas coming from your folks, but not necessarily something which um, you yourself do or you ask your team to do. You have to have a larger organization which is going across boundaries uh, to be able to build that uh, such an innovative solution. We have a few more questions to go, Ravi. Can we take them? Uh, because we are already uh, a few minutes late. Yeah, um, I could do another five minutes. Sure. This next question is from Mithun. How important is technical skills to be a great leader of a SW development team? What is an SW development team? I'm not too sure. Um, maybe a software development team. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> My guess was that, but I'm not quite sure. So I used an SW. Okay. Um, now, uh, technical skills uh, uh, to a, uh, at, to a certain level, if you are, let's say, a product manager, if you're a technical leader, if you are a chief architect, um, obviously this is required. Um, uh, but when you get into um, uh, uh, slightly, uh, you know, should I say middle management or even senior management, uh, technical skills are still important. If you are, uh, let's say, a hands-on leader, uh, 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 spending, let's say, uh, 10 to 15% of your time uh, doing your own stuff, uh, this is highly respected by teams, by organizations, and by employees. Um, uh, but more often than not, we see that people have actually moved away uh, from being uh, technically hands-on um, but they, but such people could also be very very effective. For example, um, if you were to take the example of uh, uh, Sam Palmisano, who became the CEO of IBM, he came from a from a biscuit manufacturing background. And uh, how could he lead a technical organization like IBM to success? Uh, sometimes you know an outside in perspective is required, but a healthy um, understanding and uh, also, um, you know, um, a lot of reading uh, of what the current technologies are and um, uh, how they can help solve uh, several of the problems is, is certainly required in order for you to be able to lead uh, organizations uh, effectively, I believe. That's my uh, opinion. Uh, of course, uh, people could differ and they could probably even uh, uh, say, no, that's not what it is. But then, um, what is also important for a leader is to be able to derive that vision or um, um, or the strategy by starting with 
why we are doing what we are doing. And um, going back to Simon Sinek, who's a, who's an author, uh, he has written a very good book of uh, starting with why. And um, you do a why, you do a how, I do a what, and then you kind of come up with uh, your uh, strategic uh, goals and also execution goals for your organization. This is a very good read if you're interested in understanding uh, building visions, building purpose, and uh, sharing the purpose with other people in the organization to be able to collaboratively build high-performance organizations. In view of time constraints, uh, Ravi will take this one last question. I think you'll know this person because he says he has the opportunity to uh, work under you. His name is Vinay. And his question is, technology is my passion, have filed multiple US patents, but to grow to leadership role, is it a good idea to move to management line then technical architecture line? <laughs> hey, Vinay, thanks for that question. Um, um, and uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked this question. Uh, this is, of course, um, 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 uh, a very critical, uh, should I say, uh, question that a lot of us ask and um, uh, whether I should remain in a technical role or whether I should move into a management role. There are actually no good answers to this. I mean, people feel that the grass is greener on the other side. And um, when you're a technical leader, you feel that managers uh, have a lot of authority, have a lot of you know, uh, ability to uh, drive initiatives, et cetera. But even as an individual contributor, as a technical leader, you can have a lot of influence in the organization. And this happens through your own skill that you bring to the table, um, uh, the, the, the trustful relationships that you build, your ability to actually influence. And I think I've been saying this multiple times in this talk here today, influencing capability, whether it's a manager or whether it's a leader, is extremely important for you to be able to perform your role effectively. And this can... Um, um, uh, this, this is a soft skill that I would highly recommend uh, uh, product managers and technical leaders to actually build this. Um, uh, you see, uh, having uh, patents, uh, et cetera, is very good because that gives you a, uh, a kind of respectability in the organization. Uh, you could even you know, grow in a technical role uh, to become a, a chief development expert or even a, a chief architect. Um, and, and suddenly, once you've uh, gained enough respect, uh, chief architects have seen uh, take up uh, management roles to lead, let's say, uh, a CTO uh, kind of role, uh, which is, again, a management come technical leadership role, um, or, or even uh, to a certain degree, um, uh, leading uh, large organizations as we see today. Um, uh, the person uh, leading IBM, again, is uh, a person who's coming from a technical background, uh, who led um, some of their latest acquisitions uh, of Red Hat. Um, and uh, he kind of, you know, now leads uh, the entire organization. So it is not uh, that only managers can become leaders. Uh, even technical leaders can grow in an organization and uh, grow. It's just that you need to uh, take care of take take advantage of the right opportunities uh, and uh, you know have uh, an open mind to what you uh, what is those what are those options in the grow model that will take you towards your goal i think shama we've run out of time um, uh, yes so, yeah audience in view of time constraints you will have to end the q and a here we had a lot of curious minds here and we love the interaction but uh, if you, your questions were not answered, please feel free to connect with Ravi over LinkedIn or other, uh, other mediums. I hope that's okay with you, Ravi. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sure. So moving on. Uh, audience, please scan the QR code to get an exclusive 30-minute session with our industry practitioners and coaches like Ravi to clear all your doubts on, on, on transitioning to a product manager or leadership role. So please uh, take the time to scan the QR code. Now for the final and most exciting part of the session, uh, I request uh, Ravi to please help us pick the champion of curiosity for, the, for asking the best question tonight. So if you can see <laughs> okay. the answered uh, uh, section in the Q&A window, you'll be able to uh, make the decision. Okay, sure. Um...
audience meanwhile please take the poll on your screen and share your feedback with us on how uh, you find the uh, webinars that we host the leadership or any other festival that is coming forward your feedback is important to us so please let us know Ravi, please let us know if you're ready with the winner. Yeah, okay, I am ready. Okay. Do you want to declare the name? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I think um, the most uh, curiosity or the inquisitive question that um, I felt um, was also very, very pertinent to the situation that we are in today uh, is uh, from Sendhil um, when he talked about downsizing uh, tough business and uh, you know how can we manage the transition with, uh, with, uh, with empathy for employees. I think this is something which is uh, lead, as leaders we are going to come across these situations very very often and uh, thank you Sendhil for asking this question. I hope I was able to provide some insights into how this could be handled. Yes, agreed, absolutely. Thank you for asking the question, Senzil. And of course, he uh, uh, Ravi has replied to that already uh, previously, saying that uh, thank you for your feedback on his question and his question was rightly answered. So Senzil, congratulations. We'll get in touch with you with the digital course that we promised. We have enjoyed having you with us, Ravi. It's been a complete pleasure. Please accept this certificate of appreciation from the Institute. Uh, if you scan a QR code uh, on the certificate, it will take you to a dedicated Hall of Fame page that we have created for you. Just a small gesture. Please share it within the network and we'll share the recording of the webinar on a YouTube channel. Sure. We are grateful for the time and effort you took to share your thoughts and amazing insights drawn from your experience in the industry, Ravi. And I'm certain that the audience will definitely benefit from the, uh, the methods you suggested and get ahead in their career. Thank you once again for joining us. Thank you. We'll upload the video uh, in a few hours, Ravi. Uh, on the sure, platform. sure. Thank you so much. And audience, thank you for joining in. It was great interacting with you all. Do not forget to register for the webinar tomorrow. And thank you for sharing your feedback. With that note, I end tonight's session. Happy learning and stay skilled. Have a great night.